Like widening rings in a pond, the will and the idea spread, searching out, touching, and tripping the delicate subatomic trigger of pyre. The thought found particles, dust, smoke, vapor, motes, molecules. The will and the idea transformed them all. In Sicily, where Dot Franco Torre had worked for an exhausting month attempting to unlock the secret of one slug of Pyrie, the residues and the precipitates had been dumped down a drain which led to the sea. For many months, the Mediterranean currents had drifted these residues across the sea bottom. In an instant, a humpbacked mound of water towering 50 feet high traced the courses northeast to Sardinia and southwest to Tripoli. In a microsecond, the surface of the Mediterranean was raised into the twisted casting of a giant earthworm that wound around the islands of Pantelleria, Lampedusa, Linosa, and Malta. Some of the residues had been burned off, had gone up the chimney with smoke and vapor to drift for hundreds of miles before settling. These minute particles showed where they had finally settled in Morocco, Algeria, Libya, and Greece with blinding pinpoint explosions of incredible minuteness and intensity. And more motes still drifting in the stratosphere revealed their presence with brilliant gleams like daylight stars. In Texas, where Professor John Mantley had had the same baffling experience with Pyrie, most of the residues had gone down the shaft of an exhausted oil well, which was also used to accommodate radioactive waste. A deep water table had absorbed much of the matter and spread it slowly over an area of some 10 square miles. 10 square miles of Texas flats shook themselves into corduroy. A vast untapped deposit of natural gas at last found a vent and came shrieking up to the surface where sparks from flying stones ignited into a roaring torch 200 feet high. A milligram of pyre deposited on a disk of filter paper long since discarded, forgotten, rounded up in a waste paper drive, and at last pulped into a mold for type metal, destroyed the entire late night edition of the Glasgow Observer. A fragment of pyre spattered on a lab smock long since converted into rag paper destroyed a thank you note written by Lady Shrapnel and destroyed an additional ton of first class mail in the process. A shirt cuff inadvertently dipped into an acid solution of pyre long abandoned along with the shirt and now worn under his mink suit by a jack jaunter blasted off the wrist and hand of the jack jaunter in one fiery amputation. A deci-milligram of pyre, still adhering to a former evaporation crystal now in use as an ashtray, kindled a fire that scorched the office of one baker, dealed in freaks and purveyor of monsters. Across the length and breadth of the planet were isolated explosions, chains of explosions, traceries of fire, pinpoints of fire, Meteor flares in the sky, great craters and narrow channels plowed in the earth, exploded in the earth, vomited from the earth. At Old St. Pat's, nearly a tenth of a gram of pyre was exposed in Four Miles Laboratory. The rest was sealed in its inert lead isotope safe, protected from accidental and intentional psychokinetic ignition. The blinding blast of energy generated from the tenth of a gram blew out the walls and split the floors as though an internal earthquake had convulsed the building. The buttresses held the pillars for a split second and then crumbled. Down came towers, spires, pillars, buttresses, and roof in a thundering avalanche to hesitate above the yawning crater of the floor in a tangled, precarious equilibrium. A breath of wind, a distant vibration, and the collapse would continue until the crater was filled solid with pulverized rubble. The star-like heat of the explosion ignited a hundred fires and melted the ancient thick copper of the collapse roof. If a milligram more of pyre had been exposed to detonation, the heat alone would have been intense enough to vaporize the metal immediately. Instead, it glowed white and began to flow. It streamed off the wreckage of the crumbled roof and began searching its way downward through the jumbled stone, iron, wood, and glass, like some monstrous molten mold creeping through a tangled web. 
Dagenham and Yang Yovo arrived almost simultaneously. A moment later, Robin Winsbury appeared at Inge's Bella McQueen. A dozen intelligence operatives and six Dagenham couriers arrived along with Prestine's jaunt watch and the police. They formed a cordon around the blazing block, but there were very few spectators. After the shock of the New Year's Eve raid, that single explosion had frightened half New York into another wild jaunt for safety. The uproar of the fire was frightful, and the massive grind of tons of wreckage in uneasy balance was ominous. Everyone was forced to shout and yet was fearful of the vibrations. Yang Yovo bawled the news about Foyle and Sheffield into Dagenham's ear. Dagenham nodded and displayed his deadly smile. We'll have to go in, he shouted. Fire suits, Yang Yovo shouted. He disappeared and reappeared with a pair of white disaster crew fire suits. At the sight of these, Robin and Gisbella began shouting hysterical objections. The two men ignored them, wriggled into the inert isomer armor, and inched into the inferno. Within Old St. Pat's, it was as though a monstrous hand had churned a log jam of wood, stone, and metal. Through every intertice crawled tongues of molten copper, slowly working downward, igniting wood, crumbling stone, shattering glass. Where the copper flowed, it merely glowed, but where it poured, it spattered dazzling droplets of white-hot metal. Beneath the log jam yawned a black crater where formerly the floor of the cathedral had been. The explosion had split the flagstone asunder, revealing the cellars, subcellars, and vaults steep below the building. These two were filled with a snarl of stones, beams, pipes, wire, the remnants of four-mile circus tents, all fitfully lit small fires. Then the first of the copper dripped down into the crater and illuminated it with a brilliant molten splash. Dagenham pounded young Yeovil's shoulder to attract his attention and pointed. Halfway down the crater, in the midst of the tangle, lay the body of Regis Sheffield, drawn and quartered by the explosion. Young Yeovil pounded Dagenham's shoulder and pointed. My teeth, excuse me. <laughs>